this uh, stabilizers, as, as well as many other stabilizers, they add a lot of charge. So we need to remove that charge, reduce the concentration of the stabilizer in the process that you see over here. So initially, we have the dispersion of nanoparticles. The red dots are stabilizers. And uh, we sediment them in methanol, throw away the su 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 supernatant, which has stabilizer. And after that, uh, we redisperse them back into water. This reduces the concentration of stabilizer by our uh, estimates about 50%. That's enough to reduce the electrostatic repulsion. And as the result of that, we see the formation of the nanoparticle chains in this particular case. So the formation of the chains uh, could be interesting from catalytic perspective, or optoelectronics, uh, photovoltaics, a number of ways. But what I also would like to point out that the formation uh, self-organization of the particles of the chains also indicate strong uh, anisotropy in respect to one axis. We thought a number of years what this anisotropy is. Uh, we still uh, discussing, but the dipolar contribution here seems to be quite relevant. Um, it turns out that this process, the transition between the individual nanoparticles after uh, sedimentation and representation into the, uh, the nanowires is very generic. You can see it in other semiconductors, also in uh, uh, zinc oxide spherical particles, in uh, uh, selenide. Uh, it was done by Dmitry Lapin and Chris Murray and also even with metallic nanoparticles. Uh, let's say in our work, we looked into zinc oxide materials in particularly, and we were able really to demonstrate that dipolar anisotropy, once you understand the forces, you, you can control the assembly, uh, it makes a big input in here, in particularly because these particles don't have the stabilizer and the anisotropy here tremendously strong. Uh, the example of the structures they can create can be uh, seen in this cartoon. So due to the lack of stabilizers and due to the strong preference attached in this way, they create epitaxial uh, crystal lattices. That means that we can control the transport of charge throughout the, the nanowire from here to here uh, without any uh, scattering of electrons. The point about the control of the assemblies can be seen on the transmission electron microscopy here. Uh, we can change uh, the length of the chains and also orientation of the tetrahedra here. All right, now, as long as this is a generic process. As long as we see this kind of transitions, particles, chains, wires, in many uh, materials, that means that this process is not accidental, is not material specific. That means that we have to develop generic approach how to describe it. The best way how to do that is probably by using a C emulations, for instance, computer Monte Carlo C C emulations. And very early stages of that were very simplistic. We used just spheroid, uh, charge here and charge there. They designate dipoles. There is a total charge associated with the particles as a whole. And we created a number of equations to, to, to describe their interactions and anisotropies, of course. So the, uh, the energy of the interactions of one particle and the particle can consist from the van der Waals attraction, then uh, charge, charge repulsion, electrostatic repulsion, then charge and dipole repulsion, oh, oh, as well as attraction, and the dipole-dipole 
interactions as well. Interestingly enough, we were not the ones who actually developed that equations, but rather we utilized that from the proteins in water. If you look through the literature of how the proteins are, are behaving in solution and try to find the simulations, you will find exactly the same equations. I'll come back to that in a second, but now let me demonstrate to you that uh, the, the simulations actually work quite well. Uh, here we, uh, we, s we have no nanoparticle interactions, and here we do. So as soon as we turn on uh, the, the dipole attraction, they do work, they do assemble. Of course, there is something more here. Here the chains are short. In reality, the chains are much longer. We don't have yet the answer to that question. But uh, probably uh, more importantly is actually to recall that fact that the physics and the equations, the interactions, are actually very much uh, similar to what we observed in biology. And the comparison to that can be also seen in the case of protein amylogenin. That's not the work that we do, that's some, uh, somebody else. They also form chains. They also recrystallize in nanowires after a while. So surprisingly and stunning was the fact that the uh, process, uh, uh, say, sedimentation uh, with methanol, throwing away the supernatant redispersion in water is exactly the same. So now, this is already not, s I mean, too many, co uh, too many coincidences means generality. And from that, we started thinking about this kind of uh, relationship. Look at the geometry and the chemistry of nanoparticles. Let's look at geometry and chemistry of the proteins. Where are the difference? Traditionally, we say that nanoparticles have nothing to do with proteins. I submit to you that it's actually not true because the interactions, electrostatic, dipolar, hydrogen bonding, Van der Waals, is exactly the same. The strength and balance is not the same, but that means that some aspects, some behavior of the proteins can be replicated in the nanoparticles. And for that reason, we probably need to look at the formation of the chains in amylogenin and formation of the chains in cadmium T or zinc oxide or other type of nanoparticles as the consequence, as the manifestation of one phenomenon. From that statement, we have to probably uh, go a step further. If proteins can form very complex structures, so do nanoparticles. It's not understood yet. It's not understood how, but actually that has to be the logical step. How complex they can be. What kind of functionalities you can get in uh, protein assemblies and what kind of functionalities you, for instance, can get in the nanoparticle assemblies. We don't know yet. But it's something which should be investigated because here we uh, tap in an enormous amount of new phenomena. And maybe we cannot get a self-organized uh, computer. But we possibly can get a self-organized nanowires or some electronic components in uh, the simple chip devices, which will be eventually used by p people I mean, around the world in the Africa, for instance, and other places. So now, if that is all true, let's uh, make the next step and, sh and uh, look at the complexity of the assemblies. Uh, proteins are known to form two-dimensional structures, S proteins from bacteria, uh, perinins uh, from uh, uh, the mammal cells, 
can we create the similar kind of structures within case of nanoparticles? And what do we need to do? We need to control the interactions, right? So let's try to do that. And instead of thioglycolic acid, we use a different type of stabilizer, which is dimethylaminoethanethyl. In fact, if uh, you need to check the sobriety of a student, you need to ask him to repeat number of times dimethylaminoethyl. Oh. I actually often I cannot pronounce it well. <laughs> um, the porosis is exactly the same. The result is different because we here we increase the hydrophobic interactions and we are already artificially uh, originally reduced the charge. The result is two-dimensional sheets of the nanoparticles. And if we investigate them further, for, for instance, by atomic force microscopy or transmission electron microscopy, here are the sheets and the cross section. You, you, you can see here that there are one nanoparticle high. In transmission electron microscopy, we see assembly of the rings. Um, we can establish that, indeed, their structures is reminiscent, not identical, reminiscent of those which were obtained with chaperonin or S proteins or, or, or other biologically nanoscale materials. Also, there is a point here which I'd like to, uh, to attract your attention to. The field of particles here doesn't have long range uh, or organization. These hexagonal rings, they are formed in small areas. I, is it a problem? I think that if you look at it from the perspective of making, some, or making assembly simple and fast, I don't think that this is a problem. If you need long-range order, and that's essential, you probably need to use monodispersed structures. Here we did not, and it's still working very well, creating the sheets which are as big as 100 nanometers and above in size. Imagine these are millions of nanoparticles assembled in a particular fashion. They retain uh, uh, their, their luminescence properties, of course. And in computer simulations, which now had done by Professor Sharon Glotzer, who has much more sophisticated codes than we had at that time, we were able to, uh, to verify uh, the assembly mechanism that we had in mind. Now, from that, you have chains, you have two-dimensional sheets. What's next? how complex the structures can be, and what are other steps in understanding, in verifying, in testing that hypothesis about the similarity of nanoparticles and proteins. And these are the steps. Many nanoparticles assemblies here, we, we, which we investigated, they assembled, and they are static. They do not change. We need to look at the uh, dynamics of these assemblies. If we say that particles and proteins have, a, uh, have similarities, we have to see some biological functionalities typical for the proteins present in the nanoparticles. Just by themselves, not having DNAs or proteins attached, just because of their shape, because of anisotropy, because of the same interactions, uh, hydrogen bonding, etc. cetera. 